you're an outsider to the medical community and the medical world, which I find fascinating because I too, many people like to say Dr. Schultz, but I always say, that's my father. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> I understand medicine, but I wasn't indoctrinated into medicine. And I appreciate that from you as well. I did notice that, that we're similar in that, in that sense. Yes, Absolutely. Sir. Also from European immigrants, you're from Greek, I mean, of course, my parents from Poland. So there, yes. there are those similarities as we yes. get started. But that maybe you, us. Absolutely. But maybe you could share with the audience a little bit of how you did find yourself. You were in computer science as business admin. I think you were at IBM or, you know, and then yeah. you found yourself going into medical devices, which is yes. in many ways a very stale, you could say, type yes. of uh, career. But yes. you've made it exciting and I want to go into that. But tell us your story that led up into you starting your own company in medical devices and UBI. Well, it's very interesting. Um, I've got a very interesting past. Um, my dad passed on when I was young, but he had developed a shopping center. We had retail stores, a liquor store, a bakery, and a, and a restaurant. Uh, I was in the D.C. Uh, when he passed, I'm the only son. I have three sisters, and I ran it for seven years and uh, tripled the business and found it very interesting. Um, you know, rolling the sleeves up and getting it done. So we're hard workers. You come in from Poland, you know, we're, we're the same. Uh, we mm -hmm. roll our sleeves up, work eight feet <laughs> in our days if we have to. So when we sold it, I told myself, well, one of my sisters knew I was very, I'm very good in math. She goes, uh, Johnny, you know, you need, she was taking computer science at the time. And I had already had my business management uh, before my dad had passed. Um, so I, I said, well, I'll give it a shot. And the first semester, I was beating my head up against the wall. I didn't know how to turn a computer on or off. <laughs> so I got, I finally, uh, when it clicked, Casper, it was like a light bulb went off in my head. Within the next couple of months, I became the assistant to the teacher. And for instance, COBOL, which was supposedly a hard program to learn, I, I could write it like the back of my hand. And it, it was amazing. My progression through the computer science industry, my first job was for a, uh, a telecommunications uh, testing manufacturing firm. They were owned out of Canada. And uh, I, I, within eight months, the guy that hired me be, worked for me. So I became the system manager. And I think what happened is that my business perspective and management applications went into my understanding of how to write programs the proper way. So what I mean by that is folks that they'll say you get out of high school and you go to college for computer science. You understand computer science, but you don't understand the marketing, the business perspective mm -hmm. of that. And so I had both of those specialties, which I think added value to, to having me program. So not only was I the director, but I was actually programming until three in the morning myself because I was very fast, very good, and very efficient. I ran the Washington Times for 10 years as their business director. Um, and uh, I, I, it just comes natural, the fact that automation – uh, I look at something and it's natural to me to take a look at why are we doing it like this? Let's change this and this and this and make it more efficient. And we have safety features and we have ver you know, verifications. And so I consulted for Microsoft for a while. We did the first Chrysler, what we call cloud, which was BPOS back then. Mm. Uh, and uh, it was very efficient. And looking at details, I think, is part of my expertise. Probably you're the same way. Um, when I got uh, um, after the, the Chrysler uh, area, I, I started getting my health started declining a bit. I smoked for too long. Um, yeah, I'll admit it. That was seven years ago. I've quit. But uh, by smoking, it took a, a deterrent. My dad passed away at 60, by the way. So mm -hmm. I was a little concerned there. So when I hit 60, my health started declining a bit. I said, you know, let me go to the doctors and get some analysis. And the analysis they were giving me, I didn't like. Number one, I don't think they personalized it to me. Mm -hmm. I think they were putting me in a category or group of COPD, let's do this. Uh, arteriosclerosis, let's do this. So I started researching it myself. And I, I'm a very quick learner. Uh, <laughs> I flew around the country and started looking at alternative medicine uh, homeopathic medicine. I talked to and am still friends with a lot of uh, homeopathic doctors, DOs, and they agreed with me that when I saw this ultraviolet blood irradiation, my curiosity is why wasn't this being used in the medical world? And 
Um, so I started researching that a bit and that led me to, it was uh, something that was inexpensive, but very effective. It worked on me. It, it gave me my life back. And by doing that, I said, you know, instead of retiring, I'm going to invest my retirement funds into getting a device that the medical world will accept. Hmm. We know what it does. Let's get something out there that we can help people. And I'm not all about the money, Casper. It's about efficacy and getting that patient to get, get a better quality of life for people. And what I was seeing is all my friends are going to the doctors and they're coming back. If they get out of the hospital, I know three out of 10 don't come out of the hospital. They go in with pneumonia and, you know, three days later, they're six feet under. And mm -hmm. these are friends that I played tennis with a week before. Um, my curiosity was, why are we continuing down this path of a rotten road when the road's going to fall out from you and they're not getting any better? I don't think the FDA, and I, I don't mean to say this negatively, but when I got into the medical world, I started seeing a little bit of political bureaucracy, a lot of uh, funding, uh, and it's, it wasn't to assist the patient getting better. It was more to the business side and how can we make more money out of this. As a matter of fact, you probably know Bayer bought one of the UBI devices um, for a couple million, I think it was, and they were charging 5000 a procedure and finally they said it just wasn't worth it for them. So they, they shelved it. Um, and I heard that a lot from some of the other folks that did UBI devices. They just put their hands up and said, you know, we're tired of it. We're fighting the bureaucracy of the government. So I met with some strategists out of Chicago. We put a plan together that said, this is how we're going to do it. Under the radar, we're going to create our own clinics. We're going to put our PL2020, our own device, mm -hmm. into clinics that want to work with us, such as your, your clinic, which is very effective. And I saw that your clinic is involved in trying to help the patients. And that's what we want to do. We want to get somebody healthy uh, and, and, and not come back. Uh, you know, there are some diseases that we do maintenance on, the Lyme, the fibromyalgia, the osteoarthritis, some of the rheumatoid arthritis we're having some good benefits on. Um, I got rid of some of the patients' Alzheimer's. If, if we can catch it in the beginning, we can actually cleanse out Alzheimer's disease. So this is a very effective product. And through the strategy that we've got, and I just patented uh, last year, I patented our PL2020. And the reason that that's different is that uh, I found that most of the, dev the devices out there, and some are coming from Germany, which are fairly effective, but if you look at the history of UV lights on plastic, it's not good. Um, you know, they, t they even tell you, some scientists have studied, uh, if you leave the water bottle in the car and the sun hits it, don't drink that water because it's it could cause cancer. Hmm. Um, so we don't want to cause issues. We want to you know rectify the body and get that cleansed as much as we can. And so that's how we put the PL twenty twenty in place. We have nothing touching the lights but the glass. That was the other patent that I've done is a nice clear, flat, sterilized, sterile um, uh, crystal cuvette, uh, and we're very particular on the materials that that the light because the penetration is one of the major things that we look at, the flow uh, of the blood going through that and the penetration of the combination of ultraviolet lights hitting that. And when you do it the right way, it, you can feel that first treatment. Uh, it, and, and then we have compounded that by saying, okay, so we don't want to overload the procedure. Uh, if we do that, then you have the Herxheimer's come into place. So, uh, there was a study in Germany where they did seven dogs and they did it every day. So they found out by killing the dogs, what happened is they overloaded it too much. There was too much excretion that couldn't be handled. And that's what killed the dogs. So I, I took a lot of the German studies, the Russian studies, the Japanese studies, and there were some American, but mostly American was anecdotal. And I'm being an engineer. I like looking at details uh, show me the medical records, show me this and show me that. And that's why I flew around the country because I actually data mined several different doctors' databases. I, you know, we signed an agreement allowing us to look at their medical data that we weren't going to use. It was all HIPAA compliant. And I took that data and databased it and started doing some manipulation of why did this work. And 
uh, why did it work on one person versus another person? And, and so that, that's when we got to our initial device. Is this is the one that's going to be a generic device used for, on, for everybody. Yeah, and, and I want to get to that device because it is just a really good understanding of what was wrong with the past devices and then how you can improve it. And I found this yeah. in medicine as a whole. You mm-hmm. have these approaches, these devices that have kind of stayed the same for a long time without any yes. updates. And with the technology we have now and the understanding, you could do so much more to improve on them. But Absolutely. even before we get to those improvements, let's set the stage a little bit because UBI, or I say UVB, it's potato, potato, but yeah. ultraviolet <laughs> yeah. blood irradiation therapy sure. is not something new. It's not no. something even in the last 20, 20, 30 years. You're talking about 1920s or so this started. A century ago, yeah. And it was quite popular, right? Mm-hmm. And we it talked was. a little bit before we started here about why that lost its popularity. But can you That's share right. that story of how it got started, uh, why it was used so much, and then why it went in decline until maybe <laughs> recently? Absolutely. So... The, the history of uh, ultraviolet was interesting when I got into it. Uh, it was really interesting, the fact that they had this back at the turn of the century, mm-hmm. the late 1800s, they were utilizing it. Um, and how they did that was, it's an interesting story, is that the children that were in the hospital beds, if it was a nice day, they would roll the hospital beds out onto the patio and the sun would hit them. Well, they, they realized the sun was helping these people, these children, get uh, better quicker than the ones that didn't go outside. So, bing, they put two and two together and started utilizing light therapy back then. Um, and I, I, I suppose it's the same, ultraviolet blood irradiation. And they were utilizing that spectrum of light that the sun gives out, the UVC light, which mm-hmm. is the most germicidal. So, you have... Uh, 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 bacterial, uh, which is the UVA, and then the, the germicidal, which is the UVC. So we've combined those two because, um, you know, you, you, we don't know what you have, germs or bacteria, um, diseases are all UVC, and then your impurities are the UVA. So we combine those lights at a particular spectrum that allows penetration so that the blood can, it sort of uh, activates the irradiation of the blood. Mm-hmm. Um, and I consider it. Uh, Similar to photo, um, uh, you know, when a plant generates oxygen from the sun or, uh, you know, from uh, photosynthesis, right? Yeah. Photosynthesis. The sun hits the plant, the plant turns to chlorophyll, to chlorophyll. And so it's very similar to that chemical reaction. When we activate the radiation of the light to the blood and return it back to the patient, what's happening is that it's activating the body's own self autoimmune system. Uh, and it, 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 at that point, we have done a study in Florida several years ago, and I wish I had the uh, uh, photos to, to, to share with you, but it's very interesting. As the blood was going back into the body, it was almost like a 4th of July firework display. It was activating all these um, uh, RNA and DNA uh, to accept the oxygen through the blood. And uh, in, in a theory, blood is uh, such as oil is to an engine. Our blood is to our own health. And if we can cleanse the blood, get it distributed to all of the organs, it's going to be very helpful. Even if you aren't sick, it makes you feel better. Um, and and so that's that what they, the, yeah, that's what they realized all, all the time back then. In the back 19, then. 10, 20, 30s, it was very important for tuberculosis and other types of infectious diseases yeah. that were you know, very common back then. And it Absolutely. wasn't until yeah. when, around the 40s or 50s, and the advent of penicillin and also it, of vaccines came around that it got the, basically pushed away, right? It, they shadowed it. Uh, you know, we don't want to stick anybody. Uh, we'll give them a shot and yep. that's it. And they go home. Um, the dilemma was the impurities and the vaccines. Uh, you know, I'm sure you've, I could tell you some stories about some vaccines that did not do justice to the American people or to the global people for that matter. So back in the twenties and thirties, they utilized this for a number of purposes. A lot was for, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of it here. I've got, uh, acute thrombrosis. Uh, mm. you've got polio, 
uh, which was amazing to me. When I read that, I went, right. oh, my gosh, why are they not using this? Um, you know, uh, a number of them, gangrene, for instance. Uh, you know, gangrene is very popular setting in in hospitals back in the days when they didn't have the antibiotics. So the light would get rid of the gangrene. And so if you had gangrene, they gave you UVI or UV. Um, wound infections, skin uh, infections. They noticed mm -hmm. that it was doing tremendously well with that. And we've noticed that as well. Uh, I, have, I had a patient come in that um, she was 380 pounds, uh, not, not being comfortable with herself that, but she had um, uh, eczema from the back of her ears to, the, to her ankles. And within four treatments, Casper, I got to be honest, she came in and was crying because she could now wear, hmm. it was barely pink. Where, where the scabs were. Now, the problem was this. So I looked at that. The doctors were giving her a shot every month. It was $1,000 a month for that shot. The dilemma is, is psoriasis and eczema is coming from uh, impurities in your body, in the blood, and it's trying to push it through from the underside of the skin. Well, if you, they're working from the outside. You know, a lot yeah. of therapies now, the light therapies are working from the outside. outside and That'll take care of the outside, but you still haven't got to the stem of the issue. And so what we've done is we've identified that by you irradiating their blood, uh, we can excrete the impurities through your liver and kidney, and it won't have to come out and excrete through your skin. And so you know, we're very good with skin conditions. We have closed... Uh, diabetic legion where the gentlemen, there was two gentlemen that were going to get their foot amputated and mm -hmm. they did not want to do that. And they started researching and lo and behold, they, thank God we, they found us. And the guy had a three and a half inch on the bottom of his foot opening with an inch and a half deep. And we have photos and all, but within 12 procedures, it was closed up and you couldn't even tell that it was there. Um, now, uh, the country of Canada is interested, and in, uh, I'm going to be going up there in July of this coming year. I've got contacts there. They want this for only for the diabetic legion folks, and they say it will save them $1.2 billion a year by not amputating and not providing prosthetics to the patients. In addition, look at the health viability of that will happen to these patients. That would have been, you know less one leg or one arm or whatever the case may be. So, you know, that attracted me to the medical efficacy of what we've done. You know, let's help people. And, and if we can't, then I look at it as why not? Why did this not do to that patient what it did to another? So that's our future of a CEPI is that we're going to be looking, and thank God we have clinics like yours, Casper, that's providing us the medical data we're databasing this, and we're going to look at blood types. We're going to look at in, uh, um, where you live, your living environment. Do you live near power lines? Do you have mold in your house? Do you, what's your nutritional intake? Do you take different vitamins and minerals that could be affecting you inadvertently rather than helping you? So a lot of these things, um, you know, and I, I do understand there's a billion of things that we could put in the database, but if we can get to a general format, of what blood type A or blood type B or blood type AB. Uh, and we have to recalibrate the lights to give you maximum, maximum exposure for maximum results. And that's where we're heading with this. We know what we have and we're starting this out the right way. We've, we've taken it to the modern world with, um, you know, we recalibrate those lights at 500 hours. We utilize our materials, which is we know uh, will work. And, and so that was part of, if you go back in history, and I, I'm sorry to keep jumping, but if we go back in history, what I did is I took all of the, the doctors and the scientists that studied the UVBI and said, this is what's working the best. So I took all of the best and consolidated into the PL 2020. Um, the NOT device came out in the 40s. Um, you know, that was one thing that kind of uh, raised my eyebrow. In the 50s, uh, they went into Seattle and just took all his machines, all his data, all his research, and, and, and shelved it. Now, why would you do something when the guy is getting rid of polio? He's getting rid of you know, sepsis and MRSA and tremendous amount of underlying diseases that he was helping with. I'll tell you why, John. It's called money. <laughs> it's called greed. 
<laughs> so yes, sir. trillions of dollars, right? The tr- the trillions. <laughs> what has become now trillions, yeah. we know. And, and, and that's the shame of it. Because when I learned about the history, and this goes beyond just UBBI, and, and you look at so many natural healing that were really, really effective, Mm -hmm. until money, greed, and other things got in the way. And of course, it was easier. Don't get me wrong. This is not suddenly you just take a pill and that's it. You feel better. And there's there's no, you know, way to truly patent everything like this that is natural. You you just can't do it. So there isn't as much money. So I I mean, I sort of understand. I just wish there was more education like you just shared. Man, this was really effective. Maybe yes. we should bring it back because we're seeing some problems. <laughs> if it worked, why change it? Uh, you know, exactly. let's take the best of the best. And 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 going back to my automation experience, that that helps a little bit too because I also noticed that a lot of the devices that were working, even the not device, it was a lot of maintenance to the device. Uh, in today's day and age, you know, you want people that just want to plug it in and go away and come back and unplug it and go home. Um, the dilemma was the cleanup, the maintenance, the particular procedure that you were using. So I had to consolidate that into a modernized device that was still providing the same uh, efficiencies of the procedure. So that was kind of hard to do. Uh, but it came about, and I think our next device, which will be the PL3000, uh, that will be integrated into the uh, HIPAA-compliant cloud that that hopefully, uh, if you travel around the world and as we expand our devices, um, I believe that that centralized repository will give any clinic that, that has the device the capabilities of looking at the medical history, that looking at how many procedures you've had and the diseases that it's attacking and what your, what your outcome is. So I think that's the, the new normal for medical facilities is that we need to understand the patient better. And, and so that's what I'm going to try to do, Casper, is uh, put my technical cap on and, and help us, you know, because we do, and, you know, they have the um, uh, little monitors for diabetic patients. Well, we have developed a, sil- a silicon bracelet that will detect um, the pH level of blood. It will detect your oxygen, your heart rate, and it'll link to a app on your smartphone and, and we can monitor you remotely. So those are things that I think will be a benefit for people in the future. No, oh, it's amazing what you can do now with technology and looking into the past, right? Not trying to reinvent it and say, don't look to the ancient wisdom of others and all the discoveries going back to time and utilizing things we know in nature are very curative. We True. talked about this too, about you use UV light now to, for water purification, to disinfect water. Some of the right. best places yeah. we talked about that, that uh, you know, the show with Zac Efron and, and Darren Olian yeah, talking about water, show. right? Yeah. In yeah. France, and, and you saw yeah. those big UV ones in France as they do that because yes, it's such chamber. a natural yeah. way to cleanse water from yes. any microbial um, uh, you know, things that may be in it. And we know now that one of the biggest things I saw sell out in the last year was those UV wands that the hand wands. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. We used yes. them at the center and we were trying to get more and you go to, they were sold out. They were yes. because people realize UV light is very effective, incredibly yes. much more than even the spraying of things. You could just go over it and is incredibly effective at killing microbes, it viruses, is. bacteria, mold. And quickly, yeah. quickly yeah. too. It's, it's not like the hydrogen peroxide. Uh, yep. Um, you know, and we, brought, we also brought up air purification. Some of the yes. best ones are all based on UV light. Even if you look Absolutely. at things like molecule and new technology, they're based on UV light in a sense. So tell us. We know what this does to all these other elements, but what is it doing to blood? Because some people may say, hey, that seems like it may damage the blood cells. It may do something negative. Is it safe Mm -hmm. to expose Mm -hmm. something that usually isn't exposed in our body to these things? That's a very very good question. Uh, So what we found is that the only thing in the procedure that we're doing that could harm the blood is being rough. Uh, The blood cell is... uh, uh, sort of like a thin layer of skin. It's a, it's a tube. Let's, let's suggest an inner tube and that thin layer of skin is laying over top of that inner tube. The minute you break that skin, the, the, the cell is dead. So we have to be very careful on the blood. And that was something that was found in the 40s when the knot theory was coming around. His initial device had it dropping a foot 
the blood was dropping a foot and hitting and they weren't getting the same type of results because the dead blood cells, there were too many and you could not oxygenate mm -hmm. those or irradiate those to get it back in the body. Cause if it's dead, it's not going to carry the irradiation as good ones are. Um, and so, uh, our, our procedure has over the hundred years has never damaged anything. It has never harmed anybody. The only thing it will do uh, is that it might make you feel like you have the flu uh, for a few minutes or so. You might get cold chills. Uh, um, and uh, you might get very tired. Um, you know, if you do this procedure as it's working internally, uh, you'll notice that it's making you feel tired. Mm -hmm. Some patients feel like they're going to run around the block. <laughs> um, and it's different. Uh, it just depends on what it's working on internally. Um, so as it's cleansing your organs, your vital organs, it's also clarifying your brain. You figure now blood hits every part of your body. So if we're radiating that blood, it's actually going down to the RNA and DNA level, Casper. Mm. And that's what happens. So we've also have studies, and this is going to be very interesting. That I've already seen positive results on this, but I'm going to talk about the telomere for a minute. Mm -hmm. So the telomere is a DNA strand that when you're born, you have 18 strands on it. As you age, it decrements. When you die, if you die of normal, between four and six are left of this DNA strand. What we've found is that by irradiating the blood and providing additional oxygen and autoimmune system activation, that the telomere stops the decrementation and in some cases has increased the telomere DNA strand. Hmm. So to give you an example, we had a, a hockey player out of Michigan. He was in his early 40s. He did our procedure uh, once a month for about a year and a half. And the unfortunate thing is we didn't get a baseline uh, test on his telomere. But being 42 years old and the telomere test coming back at 19 and a half, tells us that we probably did work some. <laughs> uh, so we've got three uh, patients under the protocol right now, uh, 50, 60, and a 70-year-old. And so I'm uh, weighing that, and we're going to have the results in August and September and October of this year. But I'm sure it'll prove that the telomere um, will have either uh, stopped decrementing or had increased uh, so we did get the baselines on them. Unfortunately, the 60-year-old showed that she was 72. The 70-year-old showed that she was 55, you know, so it's not all the same. It depends right. on your living, like we were talking about before. You know, if you're a good, very healthy person and you don't, um, you know, you go around and do a mile a day, stay healthy, you eat healthy, your telomere will probably show that you're at your age or maybe a few years younger. Um, if you're a person that's abused, you drink a lot of alcohol or wine, not saying that that's bad, but it does take an effect on the body and your brain and the kidney and liver. And so those are the folks that we see that the telomere is actually going to be five to 10 years show that your internal uh, organs have taken an abuse mm -hmm. on your living. Um, and so that's, that's what we've seen. Um, it's very interesting on the telomere uh, side. That's incredibly interesting. You talk about telomeres. That's where everyone's pointing to for anti-aging, right? Trying yes. to live longer. It's all about your telomeres. It it's is. all about looking at that and your mitochondrial function related to that. And that's all where aging takes place and DNA yes. repair and destruction. So it's really, you could say in many ways that the, the UVBI ultraviolet blood is an anti-aging therapy in many ways. Well, we'd like to say that, but I, being an engineer, <laughs> I'd like to have the proof of it. And of when, we get, when we get that, then we'll be glad to uh, expose it and market it appropriately. Now, John, yeah. let me play devil's advocate for a second because I have done UVB treatments before many times. And, you know, as a, a skeptic, you could say, wait a second, you're only pulling so much blood. You're not pulling all of the blood in and out. So you're right. only exposing a certain amount of CCs, depending on what you do, auto, um, uh, logus blood, major, minor, right? You can expose 50 CCs, a few hundred CCs, but not right. all of the blood ever is going to right. be exposed so how are you getting a systemic reaction if only a small portion, let's say, of the blood is actually exposed to UV light and has that reactive uh, you know, effect within it? That's a very good question, Casper. And based on off of the studies that we've done, 
uh, I did notice that a lot of the manufacturers of the uh, UVBI devices are only pulling 60 cc's of blood. Mm -hmm. uh, they're pretty standard. Uh, what if the patient weighs 50 pounds? What if the patient weighs 200 pounds? It's still 60 cc's of blood. From the scientific studies that we've done, uh, uh, the, um, the, your body weight is mm -hmm. the amount of blood that you're you're carrying. It determines that from your body weight, not the size or whatever, but if you're a 300 pound person, we pull uh, 1.5 cc's of blood per pound of body weight, but we have a maximum amount. 250 cc's is the maximum amount because of the Herxheimer. Mm. So we don't want to harm the person and over 250 cc's could become a little detrimental uh, excretion through the liver and kidney. So those are our protocols for that. Uh, we, we found that that's the most effective. It's one-fifth, really, if you say 1.5 cc's of blood per pound of body weight, it's one-fifth of the blood that's coming out. And you're quite, going back to your question, it's a chain reaction. When the irradiated blood gets into the bloodstream, every blood uh, cell that it hits, it activates. And that's how the autoimmune system gets kicked in. It realizes, hey, We've got something here that we haven't had before, oxygen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Radiated right. blood, right. pretty much is oxygen. And uh, that's very effective. Um, there's a lot of procedures that uh, are out there that are very effective, and I'm not down talking. The ozone therapy, as a matter of fact, is very good, but it's a different approach. Mm -hmm. um, you're injecting O3 into you, and it, that's going to go through, and that part is, uh, if you could think about a train, that train on the track is the O3, and as it goes on along the track, it's knocking everything off the track, and that's good. But the UVI works differently. Uh, it's a chain reaction. It hits all of your blood, and it activates your whole body. So once you're finished, we, we suggest that the patient sits there for five to ten minutes and let the blood flow start taking process. We also recommend that the patient, once they leave, that if they have the energy, some of them feel a little tired because I know I slept for 18 hours after my first procedure. <laughs> uh, it was really working on me. <laughs> yeah. uh, some patients feel like they have more energy and they're going to run out and run around the ball field. We suggest that if you can, to get out under the sunlight, it doesn't have to be sunny, it could be cloudy day, you're still going to get the ultraviolet in through your skin and it's going to assist the UVI to, to start flushing out. And so that's, those are very interesting facts that we've, we've realized and scientifically have proven. Yeah, that's really interesting, even the going outside part. Listen, everyone knows that being outside now, we have such a, a you know, a focus on vitamin D and other things, but Absolutely. sunlight is so essential. And of course, it contains that UV light. We unfortunately have demonized UV light yeah. and like to slather <laughs> yes. on chemicals, again, going away from nature to yes. slather on chemicals to stop the, you know, what is normally a very positive thing to get those UV uh, um, that UV light from the sun to come in and cause vitamin D to cause these other basic oxidative uh, repairing functions in the body. So it's, it's really interesting that that's the case. I have a theory, Man, right or wrong, I'll, I'll tell you my theory. I think that within the past two centuries that our atmosphere is changing. Mm -hmm. And by us not getting what... Um, we were supposed to from the inception uh, that, you know, by us shooting uh, satellites into space and rockets and opening holes in the atmosphere, that that has changed the ultraviolet penetration to the earth. And by doing that, that's where a lot of these newly uh, formed diseases are coming from. Because mm -hmm. before, the UV light was penetrating to the point where it was very effective. It was killing these bacterial, we can't see them, microbial mm -hmm. uh, uh, impurities that get into our body. And a lot of these new diseases are coming from somewhere. I believe that might be the cause of it. So by us doing the irradiation, it's providing your body what it's missed from day one because of the atmosphere. It's not any of our faults. It's just the evolution. And I believe... I, do, I truly believe that uh, this is a good life-saving procedure that's giving you back um, what you hadn't had, uh, whether you eat healthy or not, uh, whether you smoke or not. 
you know, this is something I think that your body's needing because it, it's been lacking because of our atmospheric uh, penetration, the UV lights. Personally, that's just a... It's a really insight. interesting um, uh, thought process there and, and philosophy on everything because, of course, we're going through a lot of changes. The modernization Absolutely. of where we are is taking us away from nature, and nature yep. then also adjusts a little bit, and how we react to it maybe is not as natural, and therefore we have more diseases, yeah. and we're in an environment maybe isn't the most ideal for the human body. Now, you know, let's talk about the PL2020, what you did, because you took a device that's been around for so long and made that sure. and improved on it and got it there. And now one of the really cool yes. things that I became so interested in was the fact that you used a flat crystal cuvette. You didn't yes. use plastic, you didn't use rounds. Can you go into right. why you did that? Because it seems logical when I heard it, I go, oh, that makes sense, but no one ever <laughs> yeah. did it before. It, yeah, I, I don't understand it either. Um, so I go back to my studies and I noticed that the knot had a flat designed cuvette and that was, he was getting the maximum results from it. When I looked at from the 80s, 90s and 2000s, um, they, max, they kind of manufactured the device uh, to maximize the profits off of it. And, and what I mean by that is you can go and order tubular cuvettes or tubular crystal and it's a couple of dollars. So it's very simple, attach your lines to the tubular cuvette. When I started researching that scientifically, and it didn't take a lot, when light hits a tube, what happens? Well, it bends. Yep. So the penetration to the blood that's flowing through this tube is getting approximately 13%, and we've done scientific studies out of Louisiana on this. It's getting 13% of the light. The other factor was, Casper, is that the devices that were out there had fixed lights that were two inches away from the tube or an inch away. And there's no calibration. There was no so it's specific testing on ultraviolet lights. Now, the UVB light, we didn't find any at this point. We haven't found any medical benefit to the UVB light of the blood. Now, externally, it has benefits to the skin. Uh, the UVA and the UVC, the germicidal and the bacterial lights, had the best effect. So if you run it through a tubular crystal cuvette, you're going to get 13% of what that light should be maximizing at. So I designed, and it took me a, a while to design this cuvette, that, uh, and the reason for that is the flow. The blood flow has to go at a certain rate, and we uh, normally have it at a drop per second, which means that the time that your blood's hitting the beginning part of the, the uh, flat cuvette and penetrating through our chamber, which is, which is patented, and coming at the other end has to get the maximum level of the radiation that's allowable to that blood. And so we did a ton of testing, and we came up with the solution that was generic for everybody. It's, gonna, it's going to have the same effect, and the flow through the irradiation chamber is going to be maximized. With the tubular cuvette, the other thing that I've noticed is that these are the folks that were saying you only need to do 60 cc's of blood. So, um, you know, I did do that. I found that it helped me for a day or two. It didn't alleviate any of skin conditions or headaches or make my eyesight better or whatsoever. Um, but by, by utilizing the uh, resources that we had and calibrated the lights, so the UVA lights calibrated at a certain nanometer, the UVCs calibrated at a certain nanometer, it's placed at a distance that will not uh, harden or hurt the blood through the crystal cuvette that we've designed, and the flow rate is very important. Um, and so that's what we've done. We've, it took us a while to design and scientifically prove my theory and we hit the nail on the head with it, I, I do believe, Casper. So this will be our, our uh, flagship for the next device, which will hopefully tie us to the cloud and be automated, automatically managed, managed remotely. So and are, and are, are there benefits to the use of crystals uh, aside from the negative of plastic that may be there? Yes. So the crystal is the only you know, outside of fuge, um, sil um, silica. So, mm -hmm. so in our device, um, the bottom plate, and I noticed the previous devices had issues 
of spillage. Let's assume that the tube wasn't on the crystal tube properly and you got a leak. Well, it went right down into the chamber, which could have blown the whole device out Mm -hmm. and maybe electrocuted somebody. In our device, we use a uh, filament called fused silica. It's actually a gas that's hardened and it does not bend UVC or UVA light at all. It's like it's not even there. If you take a piece of glass, now glass um, you can buy in different formulas, but the best formula of glass, the cleanest formula of glass that we can get, bent and almost eliminated, filtered to UVC light almost 90%. So glass you can't use. And right. you're probably well aware of that. Um, you know, uh, Anderson Windows or the window company sell you glass and they say, we'll sell you this tinted. You can't see it. But what it's doing is it's stopping the UV light from coming through that, through that uh, piece of glass. Mm-hmm. Um, so the minerals and materials that we used were very scientifically proven to maximize what we needed to do. And we needed to irradiate that blood um, and not burn it uh, because UVC light could do that at 254 nanometers, which is the maximum potential of the UVC light. If you had it too close, if the flow was too slow, and if you even put it through the tubular, it will start hardening and coagulating. And mm-hmm. so that's how we derived of the flat um, crystal cuvette. There's a lot I'm of precision all- that goes into this, right? I mean, you're talking yeah. about different wavelengths by the nanometer could have such a difference. The flow could have such a difference. Even Absolutely. the amount you pull out, you know, I understand it can coagulate if you do it too slow or you don't have an anti So. There are a lot of things that need to go into this, but of course, this has been studied for a long time and is quite safe where it is right now, correct? It has. Okay, I can see you now. Yeah, good. So tell me, let's go into the data now because you're, you're more of an engineer. You understand that. What have you been seeing since you've gotten this out in your clinic, other clinics? What is it doing? What types of uh, you know, conditions are you seeing improvement in? So my objective was to identify our top 10. Uh, we have around 80 diseases that we've clarified in our medical database that it has an effect on. Uh, so I've taken that data, Casper, and I've taken each disease and I've uh, added five stages to that disease. So let's assume that somebody has Lyme. Uh, and that was our first, um, uh, Jeff out in uh, Beloit, Wisconsin, out of his clinic. Uh, his wife had chronic Lyme disease. He goes, John, look, my wife will be the guinea pig. Let's do it. Um, so uh, on Lyme disease, uh, she did six procedures and we did it to our frequency that we had proven. So the normal procedure uh, and frequency of the procedure is to the first week and to the second week. You know, there's a reason for that. Uh, ultraviolet blood radiation works from day one as you get it. It starts peaking around day three and goes for 10 days. So what we've identified is that if you front load it to try to flush out the underlying diseases, depending on what it is, if it's um, HIV AIDS, it's going to be a different frequency. If it's uh, mononucleosis is going to be different if it's a tumor or uh, blood, uh, you know, skin conditions. So we have identified the, the best frequency for that particular disease. Um, now, what we're hoping to do when we get the next device onto the cloud is that every person's different. Every person eats different, lives different environments, breathes different, has different physical activities, is that we're going to fine tune this for each particular patient. Unfortunately, Right now, we have a generic set of guidelines, and we know that works. Um, And so by front-loading that, I've noticed that uh, it doesn't have to be male or female. Your hair becomes a lot more fluent and and, and airy. Uh, Your eyes become whiter. Uh, You breathe better. Uh, You have more energy. These are all standard almost 100% from data that we've seen, Casper, is that – Even if you're uh, not sick and you come in, uh, for the first three days, you might not feel it. But the fourth, fifth, or sixth day, you might feel a little energy. Some people, if you're attuned to your body. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason I say that is it's so gradual. And because people, you look in the mirror every morning. Mm -hmm. So if you're you're gradually changing, you're not going to notice the change. But on my patients that I see once a month, I see a tremendous difference in them, and they notice it. When you tell them 
did you see the whites of your eyes? Did you see your hair? And the women actually let me know about it. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm feeling good. I look good. Um, and it's giving, it also gives a very positive attitude to people. Um, I have patients in their 60s and 70s that come in and they, they're, I, I hate to say this, but they would rather be six feet under because they feel so bad. They don't want to wake up in the morning. My gosh, after the third procedure, these people are coming in and looking forward to living life again. They're looking forward. They're actually getting up and cleaning their house. They're getting up and finding things. That for decades, they've been looking for this box in the closet and haven't been yeah. able to find it. Um, so what I see that, that is gen generally on a, on a person's quality of life, you want energy. You want to be able to think clearly. You want to be able to see as good as you can. You want to be able to discuss things with your kids or your parents or your, your better half. And you want to be able to think clearly in, in order to do that. And what I've seen from ultraviolet blood irradiation, it's actually doing that. Yeah, no, we, we've definitely noted it also. I mean, regular UBI, UVB therapy was pretty effective. You know, yes. this isn't to knock yeah. it or say that it wasn't working and needed something to work. No, I don't you've just do enhanced that. it. You've really I, taken it to, to the 21st century and beyond. It, you could and say. That, thank you. And that's what I was trying to do with this. Yeah. I believe I have. Thank you, Casper. No, Casper. no. Bravo yeah. on that. Let me ask you as, as a visionary, are you looking elsewhere in the medical field saying, hey, I could do a lot there too. Are you I seeing any am. other devices, therapies that, that kind of pique your interest? Yes, uh, ozone generators have piqued my interest. Okay. Uh, the materials that they're utilizing are um, quite generic, and we've uh, we have in our R and D right now uh, one that we're testing. It's uh, the internals are a little expensive because it's fourteen karat gold, but it produces such a tremendous of concentration of O three that I'm a little. I, I needed to get our testers in here because I don't want to test it on a live person yet. Uh, we need to run it through our evaluation and determine that, that this is um, the, I believe it's going to be the next generation of O3. I got to um, connect you with uh, Mika Lowe from Simply O3. He's a good guy. Oh, he was yeah, on here yeah. before and he's, uh, you know, everything ozone. But oh, I, I mean, I, I, I agree. Listen, there are certain areas that there is definitely always room for improvement. It's not just one step. You know, what you're doing with the PL2020 is great. I'm sure in a few years you even have the new PL3000. It's going to be the yes. 4000, the 10,000 yeah. <laughs> soon. Yeah. Because yeah. once you start and really put attention, I don't think anyone's done that to these types of therapies. I don't ozone think so is either. ozone. Hydrogen peroxide is hydrogen peroxide. This yeah. is that, right? We, yeah. Even things like hyperbaric chamber, I'm seeing people out of Europe saying you could tweak it to be normobaric where you could stay in for longer without any negative side effects and it's actually better. Yeah. You know, so people are now paying attention and saying how can we apply technology even more so, yes. learn more about it, and then yeah. really get the eff efficacy up there. So. Yes. I, yeah. And the other things that we're looking at is the LED lights. Okay. Mm. So uh, when I did the evaluation for our particular lights, the UV lights that we're using, um, unfortunately, we had to go with the fluorescence. Uh, um, the LEDs have not had enough tests, but I'm, I'm, I'll mention something here. Uh, about four years ago, a friend of mine called me out of uh, Colorado and asked me to come up and do some scientific evaluation on their medicinal marijuana plants. And they have an LED calibration that can calibrate the medicinal marijuana to generate the uh, THC that will attack PTSD, or you can adjust it to attack pain in your knee or pain in your back. And I, I was very intrigued by this, and that's where I started uh, focusing in on the calibration of the lights to our UV devices. Well, if it's doing it to the plant, why can't we do it to the human? Um, I, hate to, I hate to put it in that manner, but if we can calibrate the lights to focus on um, efficiencies and maximize the results to that, and that's what we've done. So yes. that calibration theory from the... So when we look at the fluorescence versus the LEDs, the LEDs are great because they'll last... 50,000 hours versus our lights will last eight to 10,000 hours. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, I'm not, I'm not in it for the money. I'm in it for the efficacy. So the reason I didn't put the LEDs originally is, yeah, it would have uh, been a little bit more and less maintenance, but mm -hmm. 
will it have the same effect? And we didn't have the time to test that as of yet, Casper. Right. So what I'm looking at is the LEDs. Can we take this LED light and fine tune it to a needle point and focus it in on that person? And I know there's other devices out there that are similar. They have fiber optics with UV lights going through it. They inject into your uh, vein. And as the blood's flowing, it's, it's supposedly doing that. Now, they're getting about 2% of what we're getting, but it's getting something. Um, so my theory on the LEDs is that we can manufacture an LED pinpoint size, needle head size, and, and take that and focus that in on, let's say, particular tumors or inflammation areas uh, and, and insert that. And within seconds, you should see relief. So we're working on that. Um, and, and so there's a lot of different things on the LEDs. Can we put the LEDs under our PL series and have effectiveness? Well, we're testing that as well. Yeah. Um, I have an engineer here out of Raleigh that is the um, national, uh, gosh, what do I, he's nationally known for uh, bacterial, uh, and, and he's been working with LED lights, and he has it to where he can focus it in on a thousandth of a centimeter. So he can actually take this light and point it, and if you had a bad cell, let's say, he can destroy it. Um, and so that was the theory that I took and said, well, if you can do that, then why can't we utilize this LED light to focus in on, let's say, bad tumor cells or inflammation, what's causing the inflammation, maybe diabetics, maybe, I don't know. Uh, but we are working on a lot of different things here that hopefully will become some automation in the medical facility soon. Oh, that would be great because, you know, being yeah. in the medical system or around <laughs> it my whole life, I can't really say I was in it, but I was so close. Oh, to you were in it, your dad. <laughs> you couldn't yeah. avoid it. No, yeah. no, no. Bless some of my, some of my best friends as, as, as a kid traveling everywhere were doctors, grown doctors. So, yeah, I've, yeah. I've been around this system a long time. And, and being also an outsider, going into business, being the entrepreneur, I could say it needs a little shaking up. It needs a little disruption. And it needs that infusion of thinking differently. People that are visionary like yourself to say, hey, this is a great system, but we could do so much more even with it. it. Yes, that's my intent is yeah. to, try to yeah, try to modernize it. And, and like I said, a lot of the clinics um, didn't want to use something that was working quite well. And the reason was the maintenance and the mm -hmm. setup and the procedure itself. So if you take that and... Uh, you know, we have a minor training to make sure that the provider understands that it has to follow the procedure. If it doesn't, it's not going to work the same. Yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, uh, the next, the PL3000, we'll have that controls built in. Um, you know, it'll make it a lot easier. It'll be available. So actually, uh, medical hospitals should be able to use this. One of my friends and a couple of guys are on our board. Uh, one's a... Um, he, he was a pulmonologist and, went and, got his, and then he became a cardiologist and then went to Duke and got his MBA. And I said, Tom, when are you going to stop? He goes, I'm retiring. So after all of this, he's retiring. He's on our board. But when I showed him this device three and a half years ago, he said, John, this needs to be in every hospital in, in the world. Uh, if you come in, uh, what's the main thing that you look at in hospitals? And that's uh, MRSA and sepsis and bacteria infections. This gets rid of it. Um, and so this should be a standard routine, but telling the medical world that Casper, of course, you know, it's not bringing enough money in. Yeah. So it's unfortunate. You know, I, I want to ask you, and I'm not going to make any correlation of UV being COVID or anything there, but I want to ask you this from the pandemic. Do you think due to the pandemic that we are going to see a sudden uh, maybe resurgence of looking back at things that may be able to help us for the next one? For the, because this is not, let's be honest, this is not the only pandemic we'll ever have to face. This is not the only health risk we are. We're still an incredibly sick nation and world. 50% right. or more of Americans are still, even when all this is gone, pandemic, yep. are going to be chronically ill, many with infectious diseases that they can't kick. So let's not say that we're going to suddenly be all healthy once this pandemic's over. No, right. we may be worse off, actually, because we've been I indoors. think we will be, actually. It's funny you mention that. Yeah. Part of our studies is we're uh, looking with a uh, West Coast Cancer Center um, to review the post effects of, of COVID. Because, you know, everybody says, well, I'm, I've had COVID and I'm cleansed. But the dilemma with COVID is that 
it affects, it coagulates the blood inside your body and which in turn um, uh, eliminates the functionality of those particular organs, your liver, your kidney, your lungs, your brain, for instance. And what we've noticed is that post-COVID patients don't get, uh, and the primary thing is smell and taste. Mm -hmm. So you don't get your smell and taste back. Well, somebody, something affected that, Mm -hmm. uh, the COVID did. Can we eliminate that? I'm thinking that the uh, blood irradiation and we're going to start trials uh, beginning of next year to determine what we can do to help the post-COVID patients uh, with their living and health and quality of living. Yeah. And I think we should be able to, but uh, hypothetically, it should help, but we don't know until we see the results. Right. Um, yeah. Super uh, interesting, right? Because there's so it, many applications of this. And is, yeah. to help people with something that is quite simple, you've done the technology, there's nothing, you know, really radical that you have to do, has yeah. so few side effects, it just makes sense. Why wouldn't you? This is where right. I do have some problem with the medical establishment. If you're out yeah. of solutions, don't say, oh, well, let's wait for one, you know, right. to, to that could be forever. We don't know sometimes, and exactly. especially when it comes to chronic conditions, mm -hmm. we've been battling mm -hmm. so many for so long and they're incurable. Why right. not keep trying things from the past, from the present, from the future that's even? That's exactly right. And that's what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, you're doing it as well. We're doing it here and, uh, and the other clinics. We're, we're, I've reached out and I've got a campaign that will be uh, infectious bloodborne disease doctors mm -hmm. um, because, and I've had doctors um, send a lot of the patients to, to us here in our clinic in Raleigh. Um, I, I, you know, I, from word of mouth, uh, I've sent out to the, to the medical world here in the Raleigh area. And number one, I wasn't going to open here in Raleigh for a number of reasons. It's the 37th state of utilization of uh, homeopathic and alternative medicines. We were going to open up in Arizona originally, um, but it was, uh, it was, you know, things led on other things. And I, I live here in Raleigh, so I felt it best to do it here. Um, but we are seeing a tremendous amount of word of mouth uh, coming from the medical world. So I've had pain management doctors send me several patients. I've mm -hmm. had infectious bloodborne doctors send me some, some patients. So these are the doctors that care. Yeah. Uh, and I did notice there's a big difference in the ones that just are there and we're numbers to them and the ones that are really caring. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're trying to reach out and, and, and our objective, obviously, Casper, is try to help people, try to get yeah. them healthy, try to get them, I mean, because this procedure is simple, it takes some time, but it very, it's a very simple procedure, mm -hmm. it won't harm you, the worst thing it's going to do is make you feel better, um, and alleviate some things that some of our patients didn't even realize they had until we got rid of it. Yeah. Um, I'll give you an example, I had a uh, patient come in, he's in his 60s, uh, high blood pressure, so we're very good with blood pressure, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, very good. And, uh, and the reason for that is as the radiated blood is going through your veins and eventually hits your arteries, it's cleansing it. It's oxygenating it. It's making it more flexible so those arteries and veins can collapse and depan according to your usage of the heart pump. Um, and we've seen it. And he, he's an engineer as well. So he actually did a nice granular chart of when he came in. And you could see the decrementation of his pressure going down and down and down. But what I noticed is that it got rid of a cyst on his lung. Uh, and he goes, it was five centimeters. He goes, John, I went back. Doctor asked me what I did because it wasn't there anymore. I said, well, yes, we can get rid of cysts and we can get rid of tumors and uh, inflammation. And uh, thank God it, it, it helps. So these are things that we've noticed is that the patients coming in and I try uh, to be personally involved with them as they introduce themselves and I introduce the procedure to them. And what we're doing here, we call us a pilot clinic. And, um, you know, I, I have an 18 page questionnaire that we get a ton of answers. Uh, a lot of the doctors don't care about what they eat and how they live and what time they get up. Um, we do. Uh, we okay. care about that because that's going to be eventually database. And we're going to find out some things uh, down the road, do the analysis, and hopefully we'll be able to help 100% of the people, which some of the scientists that are on our board have a feeling that we're going to be able to with yeah. the calibration based off of what you guys, you know, the NAD. Uh, that's a very interesting thing yeah. uh, that we're, yeah.
I mean, listen, John, I can attest. I was the guinea pig for the PL 2020 for, for when it first came in. <laughs> well, yeah, I heard about that. <laughs> yes, and, and I ran personally a HeartQuest HRV assessment afterwards. And listen, autonomic nervous system was very balanced at that point. You saw improved mitochondrial function. I, I wasn't sick, so it's not a huge jump, but it was nuanced improvement that is many things don't do at all. I've done right. lots of therapies where you just go in and it was about the same. And, you know, mm -hmm. you saw this one a few days, 24, 36 hours after. Good. And you yes. saw that improvement right there in a yeah. HRV assessment. So, you know, I, I can say that. And we've definitely seen patients come in and respond very well other, Good. above what we were seeing with a normal UVB, UBI treatment. So, yes. So, congrats yeah. on that. You really well, uh, created you. something thank, great and I, here. I thank you for being a partner with us. So, you yeah, couldn't do no. it without you guys, you know? No, this is yeah. the amazing part. I always say that there are so many people people out there trying to help and then doing so much to help the doctors as well. And that's, that's really where we kind of base our foundation on. How can we find these people and apply it to help? It's helping yes. people help people, right? Yes. That's yeah, really what it is. There, Casper. What's the best way to do that? Yeah, well, uh, I think it is the word of mouth, things like these, and that's where it leads. Where can people learn more about this? You know, where yes. can people learn about ASEPI in the clinic? Tell us. Yes. Well, we have a website. Uh, uh, it's ASCEPIMED.com. You're more than welcome to go there. We're, uh, uh, we can answer any questions you have. We have the general procedural write-up of what to expect, uh, what to expect pre and post the procedure. Uh, we have some testimonials that will be going up there here soon. Uh, we'll be revamping the website to make it a little bit more integrated. Um, uh, we have forms for new patients that want to come in, they could, they could get on the PDF and fill out the 18 page questionnaire. So when you come in, you can, we can get right to it. Um, we've got our doctors that are there. Some of them are, are in there and explains, uh, you know, what they're doing. We're also looking at FDA approvals um, and fast track through this pandemic has assisted us to fast track some of the things, like I said, mm -hmm. the post COVID uh, we're hoping to get a grant from that. Um, and there's a lot of positive things, I hate to say it, from this pandemic that has afforded us to become uh, a little bit more widespread into the medical world. Uh, we had a three-year plan, and I think we'll do it in a year and a half because of the pandemic. So these are things that are very positive. I, I've always said there are silver linings to this. Everyone is saying it's a, yeah. it's a terrible year. It's terrible. You know, I, I think that, yes, strange. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you know, but yes. it's what you make of it. There are silver linings to this. I'm hoping that that is one of them, that new technology, new options are presented options. Mm -hmm. to take control of your health, even if you're yes. in a sick place or at least put you in a better state of health. Because we all know the better state of health, whether it's a pandemic, whether it's something down the line, an accident, anything, you're in a better position to handle that. And that you true. should come out of that healthy. So why not? So even why for the not? preventive reasons, something like UVB, UBI could be great. But if you are in a compromised position already, this can absolutely be helpful. Absolutely. And one of the couple of other things I'll mention is some of our yeah. patients have had dental procedures done in between. Um, we had one patient that did plastic surgery. So she was going to get uh, her breast and her face. Um, she was in her 60s and she was under our protocol. But lo and behold, her plastic surgeon called me three days after she had her surgery when she did her follow up and said, you know, I've never seen a person heal this fast. Casper, within 10 days, the stitches were out. You couldn't even tell she was cut. Um, same thing with dentistry. Um, we had a patient that was going to go. He had a problem with a molar. So we had to go get an operation to get the molar taken out. He healed. So the dentist wanted him back within three days to take the stitches out. And when he went back there, he goes, holy moly, I, I'm not going to have to do a second procedure. You've healed already. And he goes, I've never seen this. So the patient told him what we were doing. I got a call from the dentist. And so these guys are now uh, looking at us as an alternative method or option for patients that are going to want to heal quickly, especially on the plastic surgery side. Dr. High here in Raleigh is very popular. And I've seen his head nurse and his alternative nurse. They have came in here and they're now our patients. So and they saw what, what it did to their patient and they were interested. So they came in. And that's how I think uh, the word of mouth is getting out. Uh, you know, uh, we did some marketing analysis and said, well, every one patient within three months should bring you six patients. 
Now, whether they become patients or whether they become curiosity, uh, curious on to what we're doing. And I've seen that. I have seen that word of mouth pick up. We've had some people from Tennessee call us, from Virginia call us. And, you know, it could be a long day's trip, but, you know, five hours from Tennessee, five hours from D.C. Um, we do have patients that do drive a bit. Um, and I did notice while I was uh, traveling nationally, looking at these different alternative options and devices that we had people flying from Canada down to Florida to do UBI. Mm -hmm. uh, it's amazing. I mean, you're right there in New York. I'm sure you probably get some Canadian uh, oh, yeah. patients. Yeah. No, it's, it's an international appeal. Listen, if you could help people who have been struggling yes. for years yes. and don't find many options as to what will help them, you track people from all over the world. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. You know, when you have this type of technology, like the PL2020 and so many other things that can help people, people will show up, right? And word of mouth mm -hmm. is that's all we, you know, go off of. There's right. no need to advertise when patients get better. I feel like yes. advertising is something when that's, you can't help them, you know, when you, can't you need to them. get new ones because no one's yeah. talking about how they were helped. <laughs> it's like, it's so, like the, uh, the lawyer following the bus for accident. Exactly. <laughs> awesome. Yep. Yep. And no, I don't want to sell snake oil. And that was, that's also that I noticed that that was a deterrent a little bit at the beginning was the yeah. fact that we did have a lot of medical manufacturers that were, had anecdotal data. They weren't providing the efficacy and the results that I expected. And so I just, it took us a year and a half actually, Casper, to go through the data that I had that was written in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, up to, up to current. It took me a year and a half to have an analyst go through it and determine what was, what was true and what was just anecdotal. So we only took the true data, the medical proof, medically proven data. And that's when I say we've identified 80 diseases that we're very effective on. Um, and I'm going to elaborate a little bit, if you don't mind. Yeah, please. Um, so out of our data mining, we took, let's say, Lyme disease. And out of the Lyme disease patients, how many were 100%? How many were 80%? How many were 60%? So out of that, um, we had only 20% that were between zero and 25% effective. Then it became, as we went up the scale, it became stronger and stronger. So that's how I determined what of the diseases that we're gonna go after eventually for the FDA. And this will probably be after post COVID things because mm -hmm. that's a different scenario. Um, but we were very effective on Lyme, um, fibromyalgia patients, I, I, you know, and, and we've had a lot of fibromyalgia patients that were, um, you know, the doctor told them they had Lyme, uh, you know, so a lot of the tests aren't even that accurate anymore. So we get patients in and we find that, uh, you know, they've been diagnosed with one disease, but when we send them back to our doctors, they determine it wasn't that disease, it's something mm -hmm. else. Um, and so that's been a little critical as well. Uh, how do we determine what disease we're attacking? So the Lyme and the fibromyalgia, and then we have the osteoarthritis. We have allergies, by the way, here in North Carolina, it's probably the top uh, state in the, in the United States that's the highest allergy. I've never had allergies in my life. And when I moved here, my eyes are watering, my <laughs> nose is running when I get up and it took several months. Uh, gee, what's going on here? Um, well, the doctor said, well, we can give you a, a shot monthly. I said, that's okay, I'll take care of it. So I go back and do my procedure and I do uh, a monthly procedure. I don't have any allerg allergic situations, but we have had some patients that were so allergic to dust or grass. Um, and so they couldn't even go to a hotel because when they go into the health hotel room, they haven't cleaned it or the cleaning solutions that they've used there. And so this one gal, um, she's in her forties. She travels a lot. She works for IBM and uh, she came in and was complaining about everything, everything. She couldn't eat this. She couldn't go to hotels. She had to do this. And within, I think it was a month and a half later, she had to go to Germany and she was afraid. I said, well, just play it by ear and give me a call. If, if you, as soon as you get back, we'll get you on the procedure. She called me from there and she was the only one that didn't get sick the whole time in Germany. Her and the other six people, the other five people were sick. They couldn't eat the food. They couldn't drink the water. She was living life and, and laughing at them. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> um, these are things that I've, I've seen physically and in my patients results that really make me happy that we can yeah. do this 
and be helpful to people. Yeah, it's incredible what happens when you apply the right things to the body and give it what it needs. You're not forcing yeah. anything. You're not trying to basically, um, uh, you know, alter the biology. Mm -hmm. You're just trying to get right. it to a homeostasis and back into balance. And that's exactly what your exactly. system and so many natural and holistic systems do. So really, really cool. I'm really hoping that more doctors have this and dentists as well. I was speaking to biological dentists that were talking about ozone and UVB, UBI. So yeah, it'd be great yeah. to see that even it more would. so for yeah. so yeah, I'm I'm really hoping that happens and, and wishing you all the best, Sean. Thank you so much for coming on, sharing this knowledge and keep pushing forward, being a yeah, visionary it's, and disruptor. <laughs> it's a pleasure having you. And I, I do appreciate you all being on our on our uh, team. It's it really helpful. Yeah. Well thank you.